Welcome again, friends, to Through Different Eyes, a program that's dedicated to actually communicating God's ways, God's understanding of how to heal the broken mind. You know, there are concepts that people wrestle with. For instance, how valuable they are in God's sight, why they exist. Oh, speaking of why they exist, that's what I'd like to speak to you about today from God's Word. The reason for existence. Why was I created? Why were you created? Let me read what science says. Let's let science speak for a moment. The Earth rotates on its axes at approximately 1,000 miles per hour. If that had been a hundred miles per hour, our days and nights would be ten times longer, and our planet would alternately burn and freeze. Under such circumstances, vegetation could not live. If the Earth were as small as the Moon, the power of gravity would be too weak to retain sufficient atmosphere for man's needs. But if it were as large as Jupiter, Saturn, or Uranus, extreme gravitation would make human movement almost impossible. If we were as near to the sun as Venus, the heat would be unbearable. If we were as far away from the sun as Mars, we would experience snow and ice every night, even in the warmest regions. If the oceans were half their present dimensions, we would receive only one-fourth the rainfall that we do. If, there were, if they were one-eighth larger, our annual precipitation would increase fourfold, and this earth would become a vast, uninhabitable swamp. Water solidifies at 32 degrees above zero. It would be disastrous if the oceans were subject to the law. However, for then, the amount of thawing in the polar regions would not balance out, and ice would accumulate throughout the centuries. Did you get that? Amazing. To prevent such a catastrophe, the sea is salty to alter its freezing point. Hmm. So here's my question. If each part of the natural world has a unique and distinct purpose for its design, does it make any sense that mankind does not? Of course it doesn't make any sense. God has created like he created nature. He has created mankind for a very unique and powerful, powerful purpose. Nothing moves me more than the hope to know that I am intensely loved by God. So let's go to our study and actually look at the reason for our existence. I want to go again to Matthew chapter 13 and actually have a look at a parable that Jesus taught. We understand that God has loved us with an everlasting love, that his love is kind and patient and never jealous. His love is never rude. It's not selfish or quick-tempered. God's love rejoices at truth, but not at evil. God's character of love never changes. He loves us with an everlasting love. But now Jesus gives us something very interesting in Matthew chapter 13 as he shares a parable about the wheat and the tares. And I'm looking now at Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. Another parable put he, Jesus, forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. 
So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence hath it tares or weeds? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn, but gather the wheat into my barn. Very interesting to me. Why is it that God does not always appear as the God of love like he really is? I think this parable addresses it, and that's the reason why we're focused here. Now, I want to go to the, the explanation that Jesus gives his disciples um, explaining the parable. And if you'll just look now at verse 37, I'll be reading there, and then we're actually going to go and talk about this. Verse 37, he, Jesus, answered and said to his disciples, he that sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the word, the world, excuse me. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and which do iniquity. Isn't it interesting? Out of his kingdom, you mean there's something in his kingdom that actually ought not to be there? Mm -hmm. And verse 42, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath the ears to hear, let him hear. This is very interesting to me, but the field is the world. And of course, the tares are the children of the wicked one, those who are not truly connected to the Lord Jesus Christ, but enemy plants. Now let me ask you something. In this parable, where were the tares? If you're thinking with me, the tares are among the wheat. Let me ask you a question. If the tares are among the wheat, they're growing up with them, they're mingling with them, where do you suppose the tares would be located in order to dwell with the wheat? Not only in the world, yes, we understand that, but may I suggest that among those who profess the name of Christianity, there are tares. Is this a bad thing? No, God said it was going to be that way, simply because there is an enemy who hates God and hates his people. His name is the devil, and he's got a pile of angels. And of course, if someone's thought life, if someone's thought life is not in harmony with the masters, they can call themselves Christians, and Jesus loves them with an everlasting love. But the reality is, if their thought life is ugly and wicked and negative, guess what? Wow. A tear? I don't know. I can't judge. God's the only one who can read the heart. But dear ones, understand and know this. If someone is not connected to the Lord Jesus Christ by love, and yet they're professing Christianity. They can do a, a lot of damage, and I'm sure you would agree with me. And so the reason why God does not always appear as he really is, is simply because, guess who represents God to this world? You've got it, that's exactly right. Those who profess the name of Christ, those who claim to be Christians by their life are actually giving people a picture of the character of God, the way God is. Let me ask you a question. 
Understanding that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, Matthew 12, 34. Understanding that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Would it be possible for someone who claims to be a Christian to actually, if they have an unhealthy thought life, to actually be communicating to the world an unhealthy picture of God? Of course, certainly, because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If my picture of God is warped and I'm responding to life based upon an unhealthy, warped picture of God, what am I communicating to the world? An unhealthy picture. Well, let's move on because there's hope wherever we're at. Dear friends, even in, with all the evil in the world, what is still God's purpose for creating us? Well, here it is, Matthew chapter 22, verse 38 through 40. Matthew chapter 22, verses 38 through 40. If you're in the book of Matthew 22, a rich young ruler comes and asks Jesus a question, trying to trap him, trying to tempt him. And here's the question according to verse 36. Master, which is a great commandment in the law? Here's how Jesus answered him. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Very, very interesting here. In all the evil of the world, in all the negativity, what an awesome thing is that God's call for us is to actually love him with all of our heart and soul and mind. Dear friends, what God has commanded, God has planned. Let me repeat that again. What God has commanded, he has also planned. And when God said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, do you know what he was communicating? He was communicating his very purpose for creating us. Every person that I've ever met, whether they admitted it or not, have an incredible desire to be loved and accepted for who they are, be they big or tall, short, or skinny, or fat, bald, or hairy, no matter what kind of condition they're in physically, no matter where they're at mentally, whether they're struggling or they're proud and pompous, the reality is everyone carries with them an incredible desire to be loved and accepted for who they are. Do you know where they got it? You guessed it. You got it. God said that we were created in his image. In fact, look at it. Some of you already know this, but go to Genesis chapter 1. Maybe a little refresher would be helpful. Genesis chapter 1. Listen to what God says here in Genesis chapter 1 when it talks about making man. I'm reading now verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. What an amazing thing to know that the place where we actually got this desire to be loved and accepted for who we are is from God himself. God has created you, dear friend, has created me for one awesome purpose. The purpose? To actually love God with all our heart and soul and mind, with all of our intelligence to love him and honor him and fulfill the great need that he has to be loved and accepted for who he is. Well, I have a big question for you. Here it is. The question is this, how 
Can I actually love God or even learn how to love God with all my heart and soul and mind when I can't even see him? Ah, the Bible has an answer. And the answer is in Matthew 25, verse 40. Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. Here Jesus says something amazing, at least in my opinion, very amazing. Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. Notice what it says here. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. Wow. The way you and I treat one another. Guess who we're actually treating? Inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Wow. This is an amazing thought. Two-way street of relationships. The quality of our relationship with one another is a direct reflection of the quality of our relationship with God. Wow. We can practice on one another actually loving God and fulfilling the purpose for which we were created. This is an amazing thought, dear friends. If you're struggling right now with a relationship with someone that you hate, if you're struggling in a relationship right now with someone that you wish were different, you're trying to control their life, you're trying to change them to make them fit what you want them to be, you are free to actually begin practicing to treating them as you would treat Jesus himself. And I would encourage you to do that. May God bless you as you consider this most profound thought, the reason why you and I were created for the highest calling in the universe. You and I were created to actually love God. And the way that we can actually learn how to love God is actually by practicing learning how to love our fellow man. Yes, you may in yourself feel it impossible However, Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Philippians 4, 19 says, but my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Do you have a need for strength for more love? Ask him and practice loving Jesus by loving your family, loving your church, loving your business associates, loving the broken, hurting life the way Jesus would. May God bless you as you consider these thoughts. May God richly bless your life. Until next time, courage, courage.